Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. How are you? It's okay, you? Well, you know, I've been, I'm all right. Yeah, good. I go through periods of good and bad. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told we all. How has the talking about the record been so far? It's been all right? Yeah. Yeah. We, we haven't been doing a ton of it, but when we do, it's, it's fine. It's good. It's great. Thank Thanks. you. It really is lovely. And I, I, I did a thing I don't normally get to do, um, which is like not do anything else but listen to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I didn't mow the lawn. I didn't, you know, do the dishes. That's the way people it, used to listen to music. I know. <laughs> I don't know why I, I do that with movies and TV, but not with the thing I love the most. You can double task. You can still do dishes when you listen to it. No. Cutting grass might be hard, but I think this is okay. <laughs> You get those noise canceling headphones. <laughs> you know, right. Well, let's, I figured, you know, before we talk about everything and, and there's a lot to talk about with this record. And of course, there's a lot to talk about with the band right now. But I thought it might be fun just to start with the band starting out. And Travis, I thought you could give us an idea of how the band came about in the first place. In the first place, I mean, it started off with uh, Dallas and Sean were living together. And my dad gave Dallas an old one of his old Dobros. And Sean had just bought an upright bass. And both of them were in, uh, I know Sean was in flag camp at the time. Dallas was playing a lot. We just got out of the St. Notras and was playing with, uh, with uh, Phonocomb. And, uh, but they were roommates and they had these new acoustic instruments. So they started learning Carl Perkins songs and old murder ballads and standard country songs and stuff like that. And uh, with another roommate of theirs, Ted Robinson was playing drums. And the three of them started the Sadies as that. And uh, what was the goal? What was the kind of music they were making? Just traditional old, a lot of murder ballads and stuff, old country songs, old bluegrass songs. Right. So at the time I was playing with my dad's band with the Good Brothers and, uh, and I would sit in once in a while and just play fiddle with them for maybe four or five songs. And then that just eventually sort of snowballed into a full-time gig. <laughs> well, I know how it snowballed. Can I, can I get you to put on the headphones just for a second? Just sure. Grab them for a second. You too there, Mark. So this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is the song that, that, that got you in the band. Can you play that song? <laughs> That's Dying is Easy from Precious Moments. You can take that up. Why are you laughing when I play you that? <laughs> I was just saying, yeah, you know, they, 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 they had to have me in the band for my, for my lyrical genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really blew them away with my lyrics. Like. <laughs> the, yeah, the instrumental that we played. I, I always liked how, like, when we'd be listening to playbacks of songs, and after, like, in the studio while recording, like, the four of us would always start laughing. <laughs> Why? I don't know. There's just something fun about, like, I, I don't mean, know. for that, yeah, there's always something funny about most songs. That yeah. one makes me laugh because the first time we recorded on a single, my I had an Alaskan Malamute at the time, his big dog, and he howled all the way through the, the recording. <laughs> and so that made me laugh just now when I heard Yeah. It. <laughs> but what, what is the story there that, like, you wrote that song? And, I and did. I wanted to pitch it to uh, Phonocom, right? Dal Phonocom was, had uh, two members from the shadowy men in the shadowy planet and, uh, and Dallas and, and, uh, uh, I, I thought it would be a good song for them. They were doing all instrumental songs at the time. And uh, Dallas was like, no, we're not interested <laughs> in it. But uh, the Sadies will record it. You yeah. know? So uh, that's sort of what got me into the, into uh, recording with Sadies, for sure. But, was, was it like a condition? Like, yeah, you can do my song, but I better be in the band? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, didn't care. I knew the Good Brothers weren't going to cover that song at the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you cool with being in a band with your brother? Like, was that, was that exciting for you? Um, it was okay. Uh, it wasn't any, anything we ever planned. And, you know, as kids, you know, we both had, I think we both had dreams of playing music one day, but it, when we were young, it, it wasn't really in the cards that we would do it together. You know, I, 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 I just, uh, you know, five years age difference between us and stuff. I just, uh, didn't and, see it happening. And plus like, was there a pressure because your, your dad and your uncle were in this, they were brothers in this band together Were people, when you were growing up, always looking at you two and going, I can imagine being in the backyard and people going like, so when are you guys going to start your band? You yes. Know? Yes. There was that. But, uh, and then my parents were super supportive of us, but you know, I mean, because, I mean, it, because my parents were so into music and so into country and bluegrass, Dallas and I 
just gravitated straight to punk rock yeah. and had zero interest in it. And that was another thing that sort of started the Sadie's rolling was we kind of went from listening to a lot of punk rock and other types of music to at the same, it just happened at the same time, we all kind of had a real admiration for classic country music and, and bluegrass and Morricone, Morricone type, uh, you know, uh, like spaghetti western instrumentals and surf. We, we all just sort of, just by chance, we all sort of got into it at the same time. You start to realize that Jimmy Martin and Ralph Stanley are the original, like they're more punk than the punks. So oh, punk. They play so, so fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Exactly. But Bob, Bobby Osborne told me this story. You know, the Osborne brothers? Yeah. He told me this story about this, uh, just, just a couple of months ago, about this time he went into, so they showed, the Bob Osborne brothers show up to this venue and the venue's closed. They can't go in. They're supposed to play there that night and there's no one there and the venue shut down. So Sonny Osborne shimmies through the window. <laughs> he opens the door from the inside. They bring in their own PA. They get one of their guys to charge tickets at the door. <laughs> they perform a show for a full audience. They let the audience out. <laughs> Sonny locks the door, shimmies back out through wow. the window, and they leave the wow. club. Amazing. But what what stuck out to me was like that's more DIY than anything I've ever heard in yeah, my yeah, entire yeah. life. Yeah. You know, those guys yeah. know how to do it. Yep. Um, Mike, why did you want to join the band? Um, well, I had already had an, a relationship with uh, Dallas and Sean because I had been playing in uh, the band Jail, and they were. It was from Nova Scotia. And so they, were you living out in Halifax at the time? I wasn't, actually. I was living in New York, and they had relocated to Toronto. So I started. I came to Toronto and was playing, recording, and touring with them. And when uh, um, when they weren't on tour, uh, Dallas and Sean and Andrew Scott from Sloan and I had a band called The Maker's Mark. Um, so, yeah, we just started a relationship musically and friendship and uh, when Jail sort of stopped touring, I moved back to New York. And honestly, like within a week of being there, Dallas called and said, Andrew had just stopped playing with the Sadies. Would I go on tour with them? And I, ju I jumped at it. Yeah, I love playing with Dallas and Sean. And Travis and I barely really knew each other. We'd only met probably yeah. once before, I think, just yeah. by chance. And uh, yeah, so I met them in, I think, Montreal. I took the train to Montreal, and we started a tour. I was, I remember asking Dallas, I said, well, what songs like, should we practice? He goes, oh, don't worry, you'll, you'll, you'll know the songs. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you remember from those, like, that tour? Uh, I remember, well, mostly, like, getting to know the, uh, Travis. And Sean, like I said, Sean and Dallas and I already knew each other pretty good. Um, but I, I really remember at the end of it, feeling a sense of accomplishment more than I had with other bands that I toured with because it was really grassroots. Like there was no big, you know, like any assistance from a record company. There was just, it was just us going out and trying to win over an audience every night. There was no pr real press. There was no hype. There was nothing. It was just us and a room with people in it. And they didn't know uh, you, you know, they knew as much about us as we knew about them. <laughs> and it was a real sense of uh, accomplishment at the end of that first tour. I always felt like that was intentional with you guys. Like, I always loved that about you, that there was something sort of old school about the way you guys grinded it out on the road, just touring an awful lot and playing wherever people would come to see you. Do you know what I mean? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. I mean, we all obviously were a, a strange and unique bunch of people who all love getting into the van and touring like that because it's not for everyone. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not really, for everyone for a long time either. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's yeah. fun in your early 20s for everybody. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for most people. But I, I mean, there has, you know, as that sense of accomplishment, I think, has kind of uh, grown with each step we've taken as well. So there's like this feeling that what we've done, we've, you know, we've gotten to a level where we didn't have to sleep in the van <laughs> and then we didn't have to sleep on people's floors and then we didn't all have to sleep in one hotel room and so on and so forth. Like it's all been sort of self inflicted. <laughs> was it, was it a conscious decision to be a band that collaborates with other people? Like I first, I think I told you this awkwardly over a cigarette outside the bus in Winnipeg, Travis, but I first heard you guys when you did that, um, 
record with Nico Case, mm. like I want to say 20 years ago. Probably. Probably yeah. Um, yeah. And then I would know you from the Greg Keeler stuff, and I would know you from the Margaret Atwood stuff, which was on this show, yeah. and, and, and I mean, a lot of different collaborations. And I felt for a long time I would see like so and so and the Sadies. Yeah. Was that intentional with the band? I mean, not at first. It became a thing that we sort of looked forward to doing a lot. But at first it was just, um, I mean, honestly, from what I recall, it's 20, 25 years ago, but I think it was, Dallas had done a tour with Nico just on his own, uh, with other, with just as the, as the, was he the guitar player or the bass player? The guitar player. The guitar player. And, uh, and I think she asked him to do the next tour. And by that point, he wanted to do some Sadie's things and said he would do it if we came along. And that was certainly our first North American tour was with Nico. And then um, that got us signed to Bloodshot, our first record company. And then through Bloodshot, we had, it was just, uh, that's where we met Andre Williams and John Langford and Sally Timms and all those people. So it started off very uh, a matter of convenience and uh, and just sort of happened. And uh, But then we realized that we really liked it. And what it was really special for us, I thought, was that it gave us uh, a chance to take a break from Sadie. Like we could take a month off and, and stop the touring and stop the, the, the constant Sadie's and shift gears entirely and work with someone else. It almost felt like a holiday after we would <laughs> do that. We'd make a record, do a little tour, and then we're like, okay, now we can get back and get back to the Sadie's stuff, you know? And it was just a nice break, but it kept us from going four separate directions when we took breaks. Yeah. Like, it's like we could all do a side project, but nobody had to sit around and wait for somebody else's side project to be finished because we were all doing it together. I loved that it was always the Sadie's too. It wasn't like two of you. <laughs> no, with this it had person. to be all of it. <laughs> was, that, was that a rule? Was that sort of a... It was an unwritten unspoken, rule. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it had to be all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Were you intentional? I mean, your band, again, is from on the outside. I've always seen with a great intentionality. Like, did you have conversations as a band about what you didn't want to be? Hmm. That's a good question. Honestly, I don't think so. I don't think we did. I don't yeah. think we did. I think we all had the same, at least, idea in our head that maybe if somebody thought about steering it in a direction that wasn't right, nobody would actually say, hey, we don't do that. But maybe it just never came would come to fruition. <laughs> I remember the suit thing was something that we had some foresight with. I remember Dallas saying at the very beginning, if we all wear suits at all of our shows, we'll age well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look good when we're in our 50s and stuff, getting up on stage, and we won't look ridiculous if we're just always in suits. <laughs> Dallas seemed to have like a real great mind for this kind of thing. He had a pretty good mind, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I mean, it, it brings to me the, the, the anti-bio that Dallas wrote for this new record, which I really, really loved. I want to read a, a bit of it. He said... Do any bands make their best work this far along in their career? I can think of artists who still make great music after all these years, but their best, yet here we are, <laughs> and that's what I'm accusing us of. <laughs> Dad, what, do you, what do you think when you hear that? Uh, I, I, I like it. I think, it like, I think about that it's funny, yeah. it's, and it makes me smile thinking about that was a sense of humor. When I first read that anti-bio, I didn't know what I was really looking at. And the more times I read it, the more I realized how great it was. And it was just such a cool, unique thing to, for a band to release as their press release. Was this kind of... Yeah, I didn't... I was a little shocked when I first read it, yeah. to be honest with really? you. Really? What do you mean? I mean, I thought it was funny, but I was just like, I don't know if people are going to get it the way I get it. Like, I sure hope people don't think that we're egomaniacs and everything <laughs> saying all this. And uh, and I hope they all get it, and I hope we don't... Uh, I hope we don't offend every journalist in the world, too. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? What do you, no, nobody, no, no, no. Well, I don't know. Not, I mean, just that... I don't know. Uh... Well, there is that part in there that sort of alludes to the fact that most journalists will just lift from the bio as opposed to <laughs> as opposed to actually listening to the record and forming their own opinion. And because, you know, I, I get it. I get why people would sure. do that. But yeah. uh, it usually isn't something that is alluded to in an actual 
bio. Yeah, I thought it was really funny. I yeah, it was, yeah, I it it was me too. Yeah. It is funny. Yeah. And in hindsight, you know, I don't mean to sound like an egomaniac, but I think my brother was right. I think it is our best record. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. We've been going at it for 25 years trying to get our act together, and and we, it's every record, we always think it's the best one. Every record. I said that of the second record, the third record, the tenth record. Yeah, I've always felt that things But I won't say that about the next one. <laughs> well, if there ever was, I would not say that. Well, let me, let, me, let me just talk about this record for a second, because you said something a minute ago that stuck out to me. You said it was a bit of a, it was a wheel, right? You guys were on it. You would tour, make a record, go on tour with somebody else, mm -hmm. tour with the Sadies again, make a record. But what's implied there is that the space to make those records is minimal. Yeah. Like you guys true. would give yourselves what? Like a couple of weeks to make those well, records sometimes back then? We, we would actually record... On a few, in a few days off on tour. Like we yeah. did that with the yeah. Rap Think record. Yeah, we yeah. would have a couple of days off wherever. Like some of that was recorded in Saskatchewan on days off. Some was recorded in Amsterdam on days off. And yep. yeah, like we, so yeah, so very minimal. Correct. Yes, you are correct. So correct. what changes when the pandemic happens and you all of a sudden have like years, years to make a record? What changes then? Okay, well, um, the whole recording process changes. Uh, all of a sudden, we're socially distancing in a, in Montreal. We were recording in Montreal, so a full lockdown, full curfew, very strange times. And uh, and we would only go in. We didn't want to have a bunch of people in the studio. We would go in in pairs and stuff, right? So it was all very focused and very, uh, you know, socially distancing. So it was pretty weird, but uh, it gave us a lot of time and a lot of time to talk about it when we got home to, before we went back and do our parts and stuff. And... Um, that was all very positive. It was also positive, like you said, to stop the wheel and to actually really look forward to seeing each other. It's been like, I haven't seen those guys for months and I can't wait to get to the studio and see what we got going on. Whereas, like you said, before it's like, let's squeeze in a couple of days in the studio in between. And, and, and well, at least it felt like that, you know. I, how does that lead to the work being better? Like, how does that lead to the work being the best work here? It doesn't necessarily make it better, but... Uh, it well, just, it, it's helpful to have the extra time because it's comfort. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you, you can get confident with a song and not have to when when it is done on with like the parameters of of short of short amount of time. You know, you have to learn a song, record it, you know, perform it, then do the overdubs or whatever you, however, whatever method you're recording with. But to have the time, there was like, hey, I have this idea. Here's very just me playing it on a. a cell phone or something and Dallas would send that to me and then I'd kind of get ideas and then send the ideas back and there was more time to have things really um, steep and evolve I guess. Can we listen to something from the record and maybe talk a little bit about it? Sure. Can we listen to it and pop those headphones back on there? Hit it there son. I don't That is More Alone from the new Sadie's record, Colder Streams. Travis and Mike from the band join me right now. Uh, Travis, tell me a little bit about that song. More Alone, yeah. That's uh, how I think everyone felt at the time of the recording of that song. Everyone felt pretty lonely. And that particular song, I remember Dallas wrote it. He, started, he wrote it the day after Justin Towns Earl died. Yeah. You and guys were friends, right? We were yeah, very we, good friends. We toured. We, Toured, toured together we him, had yeah. we had big plans <laughs> uh yeah and so uh that one sort of uh yeah summed up the whole lonely feeling of uh recording and being lonely recording isn't a terrible thing you know we've tried <laughs> we've tried having the open door policy party recording sessions too. oh yeah everybody in the studio uh, and... sure get a keg and everyone come up stop by and, and bring a guitar yeah <laughs> <laughs> takes longer <laughs> what, what, do you, <laughs> what do you hear when you hear when I just played that for you? What do you hear when that might? Uh, actually, you know, it's funny. I remember Dallas sending me his idea for that song, and because it was the pandemic, we couldn't really get together and rehearse it or anything. So I would just play it on my 
ear earphones, uh, headphones in the basement, worked out some drum parts. Dallas and I drove to Montreal later, uh, maybe like a few weeks later. He was writing in in the car. We got to Montreal, and because I'd had that advantage of being able to play it for a few weeks uh, and get comfortable with it, I think I did it in two takes. Wow. Was done, and then I drove back to Toronto because <laughs> we, because we, what a normal way to make a record. It was so strange, like, <laughs> and and but because there was nowhere to stay, like I didn't want yeah. to stay at the studio because people were there. I didn't. We wanted to minimize minimize as much contact as possible. Um, I didn't want to stay at a hotel because it's expensive, and also the same thing. Like people just weren't doing that at the time. Yeah. So I just was like, I guess I'm going to drive home. I love that you didn't stop making music. Like most people just stopped recording music, and you guys just kept going. Yeah, that was uh, we got lucky there. We had already started the record when, before COVID hit. Right. It just started, it. and uh, but yeah, that really gave us something to uh, to focus on and do other than something other than watching Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> trying to finish Netflix. Uh, Buzz, the whole time I've been talking to you, I mean, I love talking to you and I'm a big fan of the band, but I have felt the sort of like pulsing nervousness in my body knowing that like we haven't been talking about Dallas. Um, and because I think the thing that makes me a bit nervousness about it is that like to me, he was like a really important guitar player and a guy who made a lot of music that I really loved. And as someone who grew up loving bluegrass music, but feeling a bit weird that, you know, I felt really touched by his music. But I also know that he was not a mythical figure to you guys. He was your brother and he was in your band. Um, how's, how's everybody doing? Yeah, you know, day by day, it's every, everything is weird. Everything is weird. You know, uh, doing an interview is weird. Yeah. Dallas was the, he was the, a very well spoken member of the band. He did a <laughs> yeah. lot of the chatting yeah. on stage and off. And, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's all new ground for us, which is weird because we're such an old band. We're a bunch of guys in our 50s, and all of a sudden everything is brand new. Yeah. Loading up a van is brand new. It's just so strange. Checking into a hotel, all really, really new ground for us all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Totally different dynamic. And I really had, I mean, I felt, uh, you know, we had our routine together so well. We had, it, we knew what, to, what we were doing. We felt kind of bulletproof, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of weird. It's kind of uncharted waters, you know. It's, uh, yeah. How's the family? They're okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know. It. Uh, yeah. It's. It's. Uh, it's. It's tough. Yeah. It, it, it is. Well, let's 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 talk about. Um, Let's talk about what made him so great. Like, Mike, what was he like to play music with? What made him so so great to be in a band with? He, I mean, he had such a Sadie sound. <laughs> like, his guitar sound was so uh, definitive. And he, uh, he also was so very outgoing. Like, not so much within our circle, within our, you know, in, in, in the sanctum of the Sadie's like none of us were really like Travis said we had such a routine that we knew kind of what the other person was thinking or going to say so there was no need to say it and yeah. so we were all sort of quiet around one another and Dallas and I would just sort of hang out in the back of the van and read and trade books and maybe talk about them but you know yeah I could tell by how fast he read them whether he liked them or not <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, I mean, he was, so you, I think over time you forget how somebody communicates with the rest of the world. And I kind of had a a real eye-opening glimpse into that uh, in the relationship he was forging with my son, who's, who's nine now. Oh, yeah. They had, you know, they had this really special thing. He'd call and I'd assume he was calling to talk to me, but he'd just ask for my son. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and they would talk about, he'd be, you know, I don't even know. They'd talk about cats. They both love cats. They love, he gave, he gave my son a bunch of Legos, and they'd talk about the, you know, the uh, transition of Lego over the years. And I don't know, it was just this really great thing. And, and then you see, like, wow, this is why I love the guy to start with. This is why everybody loves the guy. Like, yeah. he can really could connect, and he could 
listen and, you know, uh, it's, it's sad that over the years that fell out of our relationship, but I think it's why also, I think it happens anyway. It happens yeah. in any relationship that's that long. Yeah. I mean, that's almost more meaningful when you have those silent yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 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 It's know. another level. It's, a, it's another level of yeah. closeness, you yeah. know? Did you, I mean, I know you guys probably closed yourself off from all this, but did you see the outpouring of, I mean, there was so much love for Dallas. It was um, really beautiful. Yeah, did you get to see any amazing. of that? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I did. I, yeah. I, yeah. Really, really, really nice. I saw you in Winnipeg at the Winnipeg Folk Festival and I didn't know, I saw you play with Kurt Vile mm-hmm. and that was where Kurt Vile got to play. I mean, Kurt Vile, if you're listening to this and you don't know, you know, incredible guitar player, uh, you know, used to play with the War on Drugs, you know, performed with John Prime for a while and has become this great solo performer. And he, he got to, I mean, he got to play those parts. Yeah. What was that like for you guys to perform those with him? I mean, that was, I mean, Mike wasn't there because of his tendon. He, yeah. he had the operation, what, two days before the Winnipeg? The day you guys were flying to Winnipeg. The yeah. day we were flying, yeah, he yeah. was getting operated on his wrist, on a blown tendon. And, uh, but it was great to see Kurt again. We, we, we toured with Kurt a, a couple of times. Once, the first time we met Kurt, he, uh, oh, I'd, yeah. never even, I'd never even heard of him, to be <laughs> honest with you. Yeah. And he was touring by himself. And our booking agent asked if he could open for us in the States and the West Coast. And we said, sure, I guess so. And then our booking agent was like, is it okay if he rides with you in the van? And we're like, wow, that's, uh, that's, quite that's kind of odd, that. but okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then uh, we just all hit it off amazingly. you know. And then uh, we toured with opening for his band. We, we, we reversed roles and we opened for him. <laughs> <laughs> I know that movie. I know that one. For sure. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. But was it like, what was it like to be on stage playing those songs with him, playing those parts? I mean, weird, right? It's weird. It's, yeah. it's really, really weird. That's the overwhelming feeling I get right now. It's a, uh, hopefully, it'll it'll get less weird. I, I don't think it'll ever w- will get less weird, but uh, hopefully, I'll get more comfortable. You know, it's all just so. You know, I, I don't even. I felt like when we did that show, I just it was the first time, and I, and I, I didn't even know if I could do it. Yeah. I didn't know if it was even possible. You know, uh, so in that regard, it was. It was nice to get through it and realize that no one got hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. And to be candid, and I, I'll say this, I didn't know if you were going to keep going at all. Like, well, I well we still don't know, really. I mean, we hope so. But like I said, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't know if it'll work. I don't know. I, yeah, we, I hope it does. I really do. And because that's just what we always have done through grief. When we're happy, whatever we do, we hit the road. It, it's just... It's been our life, it, and uh, so hopefully it, it it's okay. But um, but who knows? You know, who yeah. knows? Uh, I think the so. sibling harmony thing is that's a superpower that you can't replace, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, yeah, it's going to be very very different and pretty weird. And I hope we like it and people like it, and I hope that it uh, carries on in some form. And I think that to not go and tour and play these songs in a public setting, like, doesn't do them ju- justice. Like, Dallas worked really, really hard on this record, and if it just came out and that was it, like, that we didn't go and sort of honor his, the memory of, of him and the work that he did, and uh, I think that would be unjust so yes we're at least going to do that and, yeah for you know, better or worse we yeah. have to follow this one through yeah. to the end how's learning your brother's guitar parts Whew. <laughs> well i went from uh I, I always took great pride in that the only guitar pedal i ever used was a tuner <laughs> and now i have like all of dallas's pedals i have 12 pedals fuzz pedals delays and uh I, i'm still learning yeah still learning how to do it it's a funny thing emotionally, you know, to have. To it is. That, yeah. It's good therapy, though. I think. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think it's you know, everybody goes back to work at when they're grieving, but uh, for us, we're real, and, and in part of it is that you're shifting gears and 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 sort of not forgetting about it, but just moving on in a way. But when we go to work, we're we're not moving on. We're facing everything head on. We're diving deep into it, you know. Well, listen, I, I'll, I'll, I'll close off by saying, I won't, I won't fully close off because I'm going to ask you to pick a song in a second, but I'll close off by saying that like, we all feel so much sadness for you and we feel so much, um, I think we all feel so much love for you. 
And I think the reason we feel so much love for you is because you really embody what a lot of us think a band should be, which is a band that goes on the road and plays for people whether that be a small town of like 250 people. I've, I played a fest with you guys. I don't know if you remember this in like Perth, Ontario. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we got shut down because of a tornado. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, but there's something beautiful about that. And yeah. that's one of my favorite things about you guys is that I'll look at your, fa- I'll look at your schedule and you're in, you're in Ingersoll and you're in Winnipeg. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're in small communities and you're, so I think for the Sadies to be touring through this grief, um, is a gift to yourselves, but also a, a gift to us because it's what you've always done. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I don't mean that's it. Um, but how about this? How about I close off this way? I'm going to get you to pick a song off the record that is meaningful to you, especially with, with Dallas. Can you pick something for me? Um, for us to play after this interview, Zoe. I, yeah, I, I kind of think the, the way that this particular song came to to be kind of like finished it's an inter- had an interesting trajectory and kind of was what i loved about working with dallas is that again it was a day off and we were in dawson city and uh yeah he just was like i got this idea can we go to the venue i just want to put it down on a phone so yeah he showed me the song we started i came up with like a part sort of <laughs> and uh we just recorded it and then i mean that must have been years before we actually yeah. recorded it like and in fact the working title of that song was it's called it, the, the real title is stop and start but we just used to call it dawson city because that's where it started and, which is uh, a better title but <laughs> <laughs> well we'd be popular in dawson city if we did yeah. it. yeah <laughs> you could play in dawson city for the rest of your life yeah like uh so yeah uh, i I would pick that because I do have, I don't know. I just like the, how excited Dallas would get about, um, an idea. And even if it was just, you know, a tiny little hook of a song, he'd want to do it and he'd get excited about it. And he'd get excited about having 10 seconds of it on a voice memo. And that would be enough to kind of like have a, of a germ to get him going on it. It's, um, it's a great record. Thank you. It's a Thanks. really, really great listen. Thank you. Um, my condolences again, and I want to say thank you so much for coming in and talking to us a little bit about it. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.